glad you're with us. We're glad you're supporting us here. And we're most importantly, we want to make sure we're providing to you the kind of information you're looking for. Uh, we've had a great first day, a great first speaker this morning. I think that uh, we found that uh, Secretary Schaefer definitely uh, spoke uh, clearly in, uh, about the challenges faced in the sustainment, in the procurement, frankly, in his world. Uh, charged with uh, Secretary Lord, I thought it was a good quote. I mean, it's a, a heck of a good statement about our commitment is to sh share policies, procedures, and lessons learned that give our military the flexibility they need to be innovative and lethal. Well, that's exactly what our panel is designed to do, is to share those lessons, those I ideas, and allow you to ask the questions uh, from your perspective on how we are going to do and accomplish what the, the topic of this panel is, is acquiring the capabilities to build a more lethal, resilient, and rapidly adapting force. And as we are challenged by the CNO, not just talk about it in theory, but talk about it in practice. Secretary Schaefer said this is a contact sport. Uh, the contact's happening right here this week, and contact continues as we develop our capabilities and support the force. We are very fortunate indeed to have uh, a panel with us today that has the expertise to answer those questions. In fact, are facing those challenges directly. And, uh, and in particular, I'm very happy that we have a moderator, uh, Mr. Al Grasso, who's with us as our moderator. A moment, I'll tell you about him. Uh, but we have had uh, a number of uh, panels to this, to this point, and I think along the way we see the advancement of our capabilities in this near-peer competition. And now we have some very important people on stage who had the responsibility to build, deliver, and maintain and sustain those capabilities. And uh, so that is the premise of the panel, but uh, I can tell you it's going to go on from there. We're good in terms of time. We shut the range down next door. Everything's good there. Uh, we've got a time at the end for questions. We finished at 11.30. I can tell you we're a little soft on the backside because 12 o'clock lunch follows. So your questions are very important to this panel. Our moderator, Mr. Al Grasso, is immediate past president and CEO of MITRE Corporation. He was there in that position from 2006 to 2017. But if you go back in time, his development path worked through MITRE through an associated set of responsibilities in engineering and development in the C3, C4 area. Uh, I noted in a couple things, uh, he, as the director of MITRE C4I, uh, the FFRDC, we, are, uh, in, we got to know him well at, at AFSIA, exactly the same space we're in and with the solutions that were being sought. He was also the tech director for Battlefield Systems Development at MITRE's site at Fort Monmouth. So uh, he has experience where you're at, exactly where you're at. Uh, while he was at MITRE, MITRE itself uh, achieved a number of notable accomplishments, were, received a number of notable awards, and Mr. Grasso himself uh, was awarded for a variety of excellence in, in performance, excellence in workplace, excellence in delivering capabilities. I first got to know uh, Mr. Grasso when he was chairman of our FC International Board. Uh, through a period of transition for our organization, uh, we're, we're very happy he was there with his leadership, insight, and experience uh, in, in many, many ways. Uh, in fact, uh, we awarded Mr. Grasso, despite all the awards he's been given, we are very proud of the award. We were able to award Mr. Grasso in 2016 the David Sarnoff Award, highest award, FC awards for performance, for insight, experience, and in particular his involvement with STEM and STEM learning, STEM leadership, uh, the entire path along that way. So very, very gracious of him to accept this role, but I know it's important to trigger the conversation that you're looking for in this panel. Let's welcome our panel and Mr. Grasso to the stage. Bob, thank you for that all too lengthy uh, introduction. Uh, I'm, I'm going to save the audience from such lengthy introductions uh, going forward here. But I'd like to thank you, thank AFSIA and the U.S. Naval Institute for assembling uh, not only this panel, but this conference and bringing the community together to deal with some, some thorny challenges and some wonderful opportunities. And I couldn't be more proud to be up here today with this distinguished panel, because these are, in fact, the individuals that are going to lead us into a, a future that I think we can all be very proud of. So what I hope to do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna offer a few remarks here to put a little color to the panel and then uh, offer some introductions and ask each one of our panelists 
to make no more than five minutes worth of remarks because I know that there are plenty of questions that you all have in this audience uh, as uh, you've been here now for the past day and a half. So first thing that I'd say is, you know, over the past couple of weeks I've been thinking about what to say and I prepared some remarks, but after being here for the, a day and a half, I threw away most of my remarks and uh, wanted to really focus in on what I heard over the past day and a half, which I think is especially relevant to the challenges uh, that we face going forward here. So, you know, uh, the first thing that I would say is that we heard from the CNO that we are, he, he shared a history of naval forces uh, going back to George Washington and really projected a future, a future which is focused really on a, a new blue age, as, as he would call it. And that blue age is important because a lot is happening in our waters today, right? We are having a shift in the Arctic Shelf, uh, the number of ships in the seas today are now, you know, sixfold what they were. If you start to take a look at the megacities that we have around the globe, they're all being built within tens of kilometers to our seas. It's becoming more and more important going forward here. Uh, earlier, we heard from um, Admiral Lesher, and Admiral Lesher talked about a data-driven, evidence-driven discipline that he's trying to employ in decision-making on our programs. This is a discipline that I'm sure we'll hear more of from those that are executing those programs. And yesterday we heard from uh, Undersecretary Maudley and, and he gave us a little quiz and I probably didn't do as well as I thought I would do in the quiz. But um, to kind of summarize a little bit of what he said is, you know, we find ourselves in a situation today where we have single sources for some very important things. In his quiz, he identified three things, propellers, DOD propellants, thin wall structures, single sources. If those sources go away, we have some true challenges. Uh, Undersecretary Schaefer earlier this morning said, well, it's more than those three things, there's probably about 100 key components for which we only have uh, single sources today. Also, what we heard was when you start to take a look at our printed circuit boards, 90% of our printed circuit boards, and there are thousands if not tens of thousands of printed circuit boards on the floor here today, are printed in Asia. And of those, about 50% are printed in China. So how sure are we of the integrity of that supply chain? We've also heard that the average system <coughs> acquisition time is about eight years. And we're trying to tighten that a little bit, but in eight years, about 70% of the microelectronics in those systems will be obsolete. And then last, as a future indicator, he shared you know, machine tool imports as a leading indicator, and today, China is the number one importer for machine tools. The United States is the number six importer for machine tools. So, you know, there, there are a number of other things that I would offer. You know, if you start to take a look at new technologies such as blockchain, the top five countries for blockchain, interestingly enough, are China, number one, United States, number two, UK, Australia, and Russia. If you start to take a look at things like global market reach, uh, this, this is measured as the number of uh, users outside of a uh, continent where the technology was in fact uh, innovated. Tel Aviv is uh, the number one in global ecosystems. Silicon Valley is number two. London, Sydney is number three. Toronto, Singapore. I share all of this because I would argue, you know, 10 years ago, uh, you know, this probably wouldn't have been projected and probably would have been unheard of. But shift does happen. What we also heard is speed and scale matter. And today, uh, in advanced technology products, about, uh, we are at this point running a trade deficit of about $135 billion and that's expected to, to rise. And uh, the figures for uh, specifically information and communications products today, we exported $3.3 billion 
in those products and imported $130 billion of those products. So the world has certainly gotten flat. There's no doubt about it. Shift does occur and speed and scale matter. On the topic of speed and scale, what I would just share with you, I'm, I'm involved in a 5G study today, and um, if you just measure things in terms of scale, China will be deploying about a million 100,000 towers uh, in Asia. In North America, we will deploy 140,000 towers. There's a scale difference there. There's also a speed difference because we have a significant infrastructure and legacy. These are all incredible challenges. Uh, perhaps as we look at the future, we may see some, um, some, some new challenges as well. Now let me just get to our panel because we really truly have a, uh, an incredibly distinguished panel, four prominent, five prominent, uh, five prominent uh, panelists that we have here today. And uh, quite frankly, there are no better people here to address these challenges as we go, as we go forward here. Now, as I said, I, I could spend the rest of our time here just going through their distinguished achievements and accomplishments and the like. I won't do that. But I'm going to give you a quiz at the end of uh, this session. And you, I want you all to match uh, what I'm going to describe here to the individuals here. We have two pilots amongst us here today. We have uh, an MIT-educated nuclear engineer. We have two electrical engineers. We have an information technology and command and control expert. Uh, and we have two aeronautical engineers amongst here, us here today. I le learned a little bit earlier. We have a band leader here today. Uh, and uh, we have much more, if you will. Again, each one of these is, is a leader in their own right and are leading us to the future. With that said, I'd like to introduce uh, Vice Admiral Tom Moore first, ask him to make some remarks. Admiral Moore is the 44th Commander of Naval Sea Systems Command, oversees a workforce of more than 73,000 military and civilian personnel. Uh, he's responsible for development, delivery, and maintenance of Navy ships, submarines, and systems. Admiral Moore. Okay, thanks. Good morning, everybody. Uh, just remember, it's better to burn out than it is to fade away. So there's a clue for you um, for your quiz. Um, thanks, for Al, for the, for the introduction. And uh, I'm going to talk briefly uh, about the, the theme here of lethal, resilient, adaptive forces and kind of give you three things on my mind in that, in that particular area. First, <clears throat> if we're going to get after this uh, lethal, resilient, and adaptive force, I think there's three important things we've got to focus on. One. Uh, we've got to think differently about the problem set than we're thinking about today. Uh, the data that you just laid out that the average acquisition time is uh, eight years uh, is all you need to know about the fact that we have to think differently about the problem set that we have today. Otherwise, we're not going to solve this. Inside of that thinking differently, I think there's three things we've got to factor. One, we, we've got to challenge all the current assumptions about how we do things, how we build things, how we contract for things all the rule sets, how the engineering that goes into that, that's all got to be factored in there. Uh, secondly, I think we've got to figure out how to stop doing things that aren't adding any value to the processes there are, that we have today. And there are countless things that we do in the process of acquiring things or maintaining things today that add absolutely no value uh, to what we do. I think Peter Drucker said it best with, when he said, there's, there's uh, nothing more wasteful than doing something efficiently that you shouldn't be doing at all. And I think there's lots of stuff out there today that we do pretty efficiently, but there are things that uh, we really shouldn't be spending any time on. Finally, I think we've got to be willing to take a little bit more targeted risk and in the things that we build and procure. Uh, and sometimes that means that uh, we've got to be willing to take some near-term criticism about those platforms. Uh, having spent the last five years over at PO Cares, I'm well aware of the, uh, the near-term criticism of some of the things we build. But I used to carry three newspaper articles around with me in my pocket when I go over the hill, and, and one of them said, the Navy's acquisition might nightmare. And the second article had a headline that said, building a Cadillac when you need, only needed a Volkswagen. And the third thing said, the Navy's billion dollar black hole. And of course, everybody thought I was talking about Ford class carriers. And then I would s casually say at the end, hey, uh, 70 ships later, DDG 51's doing pretty well. 
And my point being is that we don't build toasters. We, we're building things that are second and third generation technology and that sometimes we don't always get it right up front. And history is scattered with all the criticism up front of things that we build. And at the end of the day, our track record is that we've got the best engineers, the best innovators, the best builders, the best industrial base. And at the end of the day, we almost always get it right. So uh, I think we're going to have to continue to, to, to do that going forward. Second piece of this, we've, we've got to have an industrial base that's working side by side with us and in, in, uh, in getting this done. We need their ideas. We've, we've got to understand their needs. Uh, we've got to make sure that we protect the industrial base, but at the same time, we expect them to be cooperative with us and as we work forward. Finally, uh, you can't have a lethal, resilient, and adaptive force at the end of the day if, if you don't have the infrastructure to sustain that force going forward. Because we can build the greatest stuff in the world, but if it's not reliable and we don't sustain it, uh, we are going to have problems. And that includes maintenance. Our, our ability to get ships and submarines and combat systems, et cetera, in and out of maintenance on time to the fleet is critically important to what we do. Uh, back in 1992, at the peak of the Reagan buildup, we had about 596 ships, and we had about 100 of those ships deployed. Today, we have 287 ships, and we have about 100 of those ships deployed. And that's all you need to know about where, what the, the demands on the force is today. It hasn't gone down. And our ability to get those ships in and out of maintenance is critically important and is every bit as important to this whole, when you talk about a lethal, resilient, and adaptive force, if they're sitting in a shipyard somewhere, they're not doing us any good. So that probably tends to be the less uh, sexy part of the business, but it is every bit as critical as the upfront piece that we're building. And we've really got to get better at what we're doing today. 30% of our DDG, we only deliver in 30% of our DDGs out of maintenance on time. We've got a backlog of submarine maintenance, and we've got to put a concerted effort on both the public side and the private sector side, working with industry if we expect to get better. If we don't solve that piece, we can build the best ships in the, in the combat systems of the world. If we don't solve that piece, at the end of the day, uh, we're really not going to deliver the force to the combatant commanders that they need. And so with that, I will yield the rest of my time and turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you, Admiral Moore. Let me uh, introduce Vice Admiral Dean Peters. He is the commander of Naval Air Systems Command. And uh, I'll cheat a little here. It should be no surprise that he's one of the two pilots on, on the floor with uh, more than 3,800 flight hours. Uh, Admiral Peters, please. Uh, thank you, Al. And for those that are keeping track, uh, I am not the band leader. So <laughs> I appreciate the topic and I appreciate the uh, focus uh, you know, that Admiral Moore put on sustainment and uh, that's been evident in this conference. As an organization, the Naval Air Systems Command delivers weapon systems and we sustain weapon systems. And we, re we really don't do a whole lot more. At least we're not supposed to do a whole lot more. Uh, we do have some pockets that are adaptable uh, and, but mostly we're slow to adapt. I want to talk about the people side of this uh, as we go forward with the panel. And I want, uh, in terms of examples of where we are adaptable, uh, from a maintenance standpoint in our uh, fleet readiness centers, our, our depots, we can uh, turn on capability pretty quickly. Uh, we just recently uh, turned on a, a generator repair capability up in Whidbey. We recognized that we had a need there. The only thing we were really waiting on was uh, you know, building a wall so that we could enclose the, the test equipment. Uh, the, a side note there is that we don't always look at this holistically, and we are going to do better at that. But that's one area that we do adapt pretty quickly. Some areas that we need to improve, though, are, again, associated with our resources. We have a fairly large laboratory infrastructure, over 900 labs at our warfare centers. Uh, and we, we haven't changed what those labs have done for a very long time. So knowing the audience here, I want to encourage you that if you have technology and you just don't have the laboratory or the range to test it on, we have cooperative research and development agreements. And we've used those successfully uh, with the folks that know about them, uh, generally some of the, the larger companies uh, for their radars and rocket motors and uh, other type of things that they want to integrate into weapons and they just don't have a place to, to do it or to test it. Uh, but it's a great opportunity for small businesses. Uh, the, the other area, you know, is our people. And, uh, you know, for, for the Naval Air Systems Command, we really have to change the way our organization 
is constructed in order to improve this. We have a tremendous technical workforce. In fact, we have tremendous expertise in a number of areas. Uh, our problem is we're kind of over-specialized, and that is an inhibitor to agility and adaptability. And that's an area that, that we're going to have to change if we want to it, keep pace or even catch up uh, with the threat. Uh, for instance, I mean, we, we have probably some of the world's most renowned experts on engine oil. Uh, at the same time, we say, hey, we, we, we need network engineers, we need cyber security engineers and testers, and everyone just says, well, I guess we better go hire some folks. Uh, that's not the way the commercial industry does this. Uh, they are able to leap, uh, they, at least the successful companies, uh, they're able to leap in technology areas, and that's an area that we're going to have to do that. Um, the other piece that, that kind of holds us back a little bit is this concept of technical authority. Uh, there's some areas where we absolutely have that in terms of airworthiness, in terms of our contracting, uh, but we need to put a much more narrow scope around that and probably do away with the concept of technical authority on every other aspect that, that we use it for. And what I'm really talking about is taking our workforce and turning them into a services organization, a technical services organization, a business services organization, so that when we have a mission need, uh, the workforce is engaged to solve that mission problem, that problem statement that uh, Emma Moore talked about. Uh, instead of being you know, the, the folks that you have to go to to get permission from, they're the gatekeepers. They're the folks that have the righteous position because they're protecting technical authority. That's an area that, that we are going to change within the Naval Air Systems Command. It's important from a retention standpoint too. Uh, we've, uh, we've seen some of our younger folks that, uh, that we've been successful at hiring have left you know, after a short time and usually it's not necessarily because they have uh, other opportunities, it's because they feel like they're not contributing the, uh, because we've got this multi-layered approach to approving. And uh, so those folks, some of those folks are always gonna leave because of the other opportunities uh, and because they're more mobile than uh, older generations. But uh, I wanna attack that aspect of empowering our individuals to actually make a contribution. Uh, I guess the, the last thing I'll leave you with is uh, we, we do, uh, as Emma Moore said, usually make the right choices. The question is the speed at which we're making those choices. And uh, it's not a matter now of, of even getting passed by the competition. Uh, we, we're, we can't even see the competition, uh, as Mr. Grasso said, in terms of some of the technology that's, that's being fielded out there. So with that, I look forward to your questions and I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Admiral Peters. Let me uh, introduce our, our next speaker, and that's Rear Admiral uh, Jack Vogt. He is the Coast Guard's Assistant Commandant for Response uh, Policy and uh, has an interesting note, he received the Federal Executive Board Heroism Award uh, for a rescue not far from here in uh, Los Angeles. Well, thank you, sir, I appreciate that. And um, I am not the one in the Navy or Marine Corps, so that'll help you with that part of the quiz. <laughs> and I'm also not the one who has a son in the U.S. Coast Guard, so I feel good about our recruiting program thus far. So uh, we'll let someone uh, come clean on that in a little bit. Uh, I, I'm gonna just briefly mention um, a couple items. Our, our esteemed moderator asked us to talk about where do we stand relative to our competitive edge, bringing technology on board um, as related to contracting and acquisition processes. And I think in general, and, in, and certainly in deference to our advanced research labs, our, our, our unique ac uh, contracting and acquisition programs we do have in place, in general, and, and this is not necessarily a criticism, but we tend to focus on on this idea of sustainability and maintainability for a long term. Our FARs, our processes, our programs are designed to buy big stuff, a lot of stuff, for a long, long time. And when it comes to technology, 
I think there's an opportunity to us for think more in terms of agility and adaptability versus sustainability and maintainability. Acknowledge up front that in less than the eight year acquisition cycle, the technology is gonna be obsolete. So that we kind of embrace more of a one, three, five year cycle for pure technology. The things we put inside the tubes that fly in the air or float on the water or operate in the undersea environment. Uh, in the Coast Guard, we're not uh, just given our budget situation. We're not really privy to standing up advanced research labs. We certainly leverage our DOD partners and other elements of the interagency to make that happen. So we look at programs and policy efforts to help us empower the operational commanders out in the field, those commanding officers and officers in charge, to, to use decision, to push down decision-making at their level to overcome technological disadvantage to get things done um, in the context of pushing waivers down, um, creating new programs that focus on maintenance. Uh, right now, we traditionally have a maintenance cycle driving the deployment or driving the operational cycle. We're working hard to flip-flop that to have the operational cycle be the lead and build the maintenance around that. Very difficult to do, but it puts the focus back on operations and getting the warfighter, getting the Coast Guard women and men the resources they need in an agile and an adaptable time frame. Um, I'll leave it at that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, the, our next speaker is uh, General Pasagian, who's the commander of Marine Corps Systems Command. He's a New York City native. Um, and, uh, you know, as a Marine, I always, you know, knew he was going to be a, a tough individual. As a New Yorker, I knew he was going to be a tough individual. But he had to be tough because what I found out a little bit earlier is he's, as a, he's a Dallas fan who was living in New York. So uh, that, General. I don't know if I appreciate that introduction. Thanks, Al. Uh, but, uh, yes, yeah, some childhood kids who I know probably come back and fight me. Um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be up here with you. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, just a couple, couple of things from, from our fighting hall and how we see things um, in the Quantico uh, area and in the headquarters Marine Corps apparatus. Uh, there, there are roughly 42,000 Marines deployed, forward deployed right now in over 68 countries, in, in 68 countries. And that's, that's kind of a big deal. What that means for us is um, we're, we're forward deployed in the thick of it. We're in those phases of the operation where we're shaping and uh, setting conditions uh, for, for contingencies to come. And we hope that they don't, but we need to be prepared so that uh, when they do, we're prepared to react. How, how that relates to uh, the, the, the topic at hand is what I'll talk to you a little bit about for the lethality, resiliency, and adaptability. Um, there are two major thrust areas that I'd like to get across to you today and make very clear to you. I think it's an opportunity for me to tell you what's really important to us. One, um, I think yesterday you've already heard from Brigadier General Wortman, you know, um, there's a very logical sequence in how we're shaping um, our responsiveness to, to the future, and that starts with the Futures uh, Directorate, and that's General Wortman. He's the Commanding General of the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab. He does the experimentation, uh, the exercises, and makes some science and technology investments through our friends at O&R and, uh, and the Navy uh, to look at those, those uh, capabilities that, that will help to shape that, that battlefield of the future. Um, next, that's transitioned over to the combat development. Uh, Deputy Commandant, that's Lieutenant General Berger, and uh, Brigadier General Adams. Uh, so those are the guys who actually write the capabilities and requirements, documents, and then uh, we work with us to develop a material solution. And ultimately, success is getting gear into the meat hooks of Marines, as we say. So though that triumvirate, very, very important. And who you engage with from an industry perspective, uh, is, is very important to us for the future development. Uh, second issue, we're laser focused on 2025. 2025 is where our Commandant led the Marine Corps Force Structure Review. Uh, we, we made changes to something as uh, fundamental as the Marine Rifle Squad. 
um, and we're doing things that sort of you know build from in a very deductive way from from the bottom up uh, for the sake of uh, the the 19 year old steely eyed killer uh, infantry marine on the ground. There are, uh, our starting point has been the national defense strategy that gives us some pretty specific direction, uh, but also gives us the agility to traverse through this threat environment um, that we're looking at as we, as we approach 2025. That said, there are seven lines of effort that I'd appreciate just putting to your attention for what drives us. And, and I'll, I'll just sort of caveat all that by saying it, it's pressurized not only by those three um, general officers that I mentioned, um, you know, in the Futures Directorate, Combat Development, and Systems Command, and, and our PEO, of course, uh, but it's also pressurized by what we call advocacy in the Marine Corps. And those are the functional warfighters, you know, that go across every warfighting function. They really pressurize uh, the environment and tell us what to go after in a prioritized sense. Uh, but those seven LOEs are uh, command and control in a degraded environment. We think, uh, as, as you'll probably hear General Neller say tomorrow, that we anticipate fighting to get to the fight, uh, and degraded C2 is something that we need to anticipate and learn to deal with. So that's something that we're working on in Quantico through things like a common handheld tablet that projects the, an array of the warfighting functions on this singular platform so that it looks the same way when you're either exiting a V-22 or coming outside of an ACV. Uh, Long-range precision fires, whether it be uh, land-based uh, strike anti-ship or uh, something like organic precision fires coming from platforms that are operating on a battlefield today. Uh, information warfare, this is a very dynamic area, and you've heard a couple of speakers talk already to the pace at which we're moving. We see that as a, as a benefit and something that we need to take advantage of. And I'll tell you that we are. We're using technologies that we just spent 17 years in, uh, in the Middle East uh, developing and honing, and we're using those in a very different way in the future with an eye towards uh, uh, the 2025 timeframe. Uh, as an example, multifunction electronic warfare. Uh, to, to get after the IWPs. Air defense, um, if, if you just turn on your television in, in the morning and you look at the morning news, whether it's Gatwick, Newark Airport, or places that involve the, uh, uh, the military operation, you'll see uh, intrusions made by things like uh, drones and uh, counter UAS is a big deal for us, but in general, uh, permissive uh, environments we think are a thing of the past. Having to deal with that in a very real way is something that, that's, that's here to stay. Uh, protect and mobility. Our PEO and uh, our Marines here from McTissa are showing you uh, there's an ACV here out on the floor. Uh, but, but this is a tremendous capability that brings um, survivable and, and extraordinarily lethal platforms to the fight for us while uh, serving as a strategic lift from ship to shore and enabling uh, the Marine Corps to work with the Navy very closely to do something that's so unique, projecting power. Projecting power like that from ship to shore is extraordinarily difficult, and it's a, it's a niche that we as a nation share, uh, and uh, we, we sort of protect that and look to hone that skill as we go forward with platforms like JLTV and in the future, um, uh, our uh, ARV, our next generation reconnaissance vehicle. Uh, our sixth line of effort is logistics, AM, I call it advanced manufacturing, which it includes additive, subtractive, all sorts of things. It's, it's making that mechanic, that machinist, um, on the beach in, uh, uh, in a contingency operation much more effective and dealing with industry in a way that we can, we can print a part uh, in a uh, contingency environment and, and deal with the intellectual property issues uh, you know, as a, as a matter of uh, mission and doing it quickly. Uh, but we look at prolonging and elongating range and depth of the supply chain using that technology. And that tech is here, as you all know, that's here today. Um, and we're leveraging that in a very real way today. And the last thing I'll leave you with uh, on, on the lines of effort, our seventh is the, cl the Close Combat Lethality Task Force. Uh, we enjoyed a lot of advocacy there from uh, uh, and we continue to do so from OSD, but I'm talking about 
um, 15,000 brand new, um, state of the art, uh, uh, you know, the, the best weapon that money can buy us in the M27. We began taking delivery of that today and the entire ground combat element of the Marine Corps is gonna be outfitted uh, with, uh, with that weapon. So that's, that's a very real way. That's not stuff that we're doing in terms of research and development, but that's real stuff that's in production, and we just took delivery of the first 700 or so of those weapons uh, in, in the past few weeks. Uh, things like suppressors, uh, bino and improved NVGs, but truly enabling that Marine on the ground uh, he or she will be truly uh, the most lethal, resilient, and adaptive uh, element of, of what we're doing in the future. Um, I really liked what, I, I think it was Admiral Peters said something about sustainment. Um, buying something and putting it out in a field is starkly different from sustaining that. If we have any hope of, of making an impact, we need to develop this thing with a, with, with a sustainment phase in mind. So it's a full contact sport. I'm with Al Schaefer on that. Um, it's a people business, and it's also a leadership business, and I hope that when you get around and talk to folks today, um, in, in this uniform at least, you get to appreciate their leadership and their impact on this thing. Um, thanks for the opportunity. look forward to your questions. General, thank you very much. Let me introduce uh, our uh, last but not least speaker, Rear Admiral uh, Boris Becker. Admiral Becker is the commander of Space and Naval Warfare Command, Spay War. He is a consummate uh, technical professional, and he was recognized as the Navy's Acquisition Professional of the Year. Admiral Becker. Uh, thanks, Al. <clears throat> Appreciate the nice and brief introduction. Um, here's my hint for the quiz. You can't spell geek without double E. <laughs> <laughs> All right, if you're playing buzzword bingo out there, you're about to run the table. AI, machine learning, AM, blockchain, 5G, IoT, quantum compute, data science, cloud computing, cybersecurity. Anybody win? What do all those things have in common? Well, that's a good guess. Spayware, yeah, give that man a <laughs> simulator. It's information. It's information in warfare and information as warfare. If you walk the floor out there, you will find somebody or somebodies who are right now working on one, two, or three of those buzzwords and working on the technology and delivering that technology. As are we because we need it. We need it to be lethal. And we're working on things like, <clears throat> I guess somebody coined the phrase, the nerdy net, uh, the research and development uh, establishment net that is a development and operations or DevOps environment where we can move at speed to deliver lethal capabilities. Lethal capabilities in software, you ask? Well, yeah, lethal capabilities that are software. And I'm not talking about computer network attack or anything like that, or offensive ops. I'm talking about the ability to command and control the fight. I'm talking about the ability to sense the environment. And I'm talking about the ability to direct fires, integrate fires. That's information as warfare. And that's what we're working on. So if you talk about lethality, you can talk about the technical side of things um, like that. You can talk about the same thing uh, I just described as part of our agility strategy. But we've also got to look for agility strategies that reach into our acquisition processes. And to that extent, Naval Information Warfare Center Atlantic released the IWRP earlier this year, the Information Warfare Research Project OTA. That's going to allow us to move a whole lot faster than traditional strategies. As Secretary Gertz told us, use the entire width of the road of your acquisition rule set. You don't have to break the rules. You just have to use them. And we're seeing that with an OTA and other structures like that, we can go faster. We can be more lethal, and we can go faster in our technology and in our processes. But also, also with our people, because ultimately that, that's what's going to make the difference. And I just want to brag a little bit right now about our spay warriors. Uh, for those of you who are keeping track, 
the federal uh, 100 just came out of last week or so. We had three spay warriors on that list. Moving fast, moving at speed, delivering lethal capabilities for the war fight. I'm going to say uh, ditto to a lot of the other things and statements you heard earlier, um, but I'll leave you with one quote uh, that I find uh, particularly appropriate when we talk about being able to go faster, being able to think about things differently, how we approach things, how we buy things, how we require things, and how we get after the fight. So we can keep improving the way we're doing business today, but if we need to do business completely differently in order to move at speed and scale, we've got to figure out what that different is. And you heard some descriptions of that earlier. So the quote I'll leave you with comes from uh, somebody named Decoy Dunaway. Don't do stupid better. As you're out there right now in industry and you're looking at technology and you're developing cloud or AM or data science or cybersecurity or whatever the widget is that you've got, Help us by thinking about how we could use that technology to do things differently and not just apply it so we can do, maybe not stupid, but do what we're doing even better. We gotta do something different. That's my ask of you. With that, I'll see the rest of the time for questions. Thank you, Admiral. So let me give you all an opportunity here to ask this panel some questions. These are the individuals that are seeding and executing plans for our future forces. So if you're interested in the future, I hope you'll ask some uh, excellent questions. So let me just start by asking the first question. And the first question is, you know, uh, the now ranking Republican uh, on the House Armed Services Committee, Representative Thornberry has signaled his support for a $750 billion top line for 2020. So we've talked a lot about speed, we've talked a lot about scale uh, and efficiency. So we're, we're looking, time is compressed, 2020 is around the corner. Uh, given our contracting practices and workforce, uh, do we think we can execute such a budget efficiently and effectively? <coughs> Let me start with Admiral Moore. Well, the answer to that is resoundingly yes. We absolutely can execute that uh, efficiently and effectively. And it's not just about spending money. Um, at the end of the day, it's about outcomes and what we're trying to generate. But across the inter naval enterprise, whether you're talking the information warfare stuff that uh, Boris is getting at, or you're talking the aviation readiness that the Dean's working here, or the shipbuilding portion, there are more requirements and more needs out there than we have funds for today. And so. While the $750 billion sounds like a lot at the top line, I will tell you over the last two years as we've increased the size of the budget, um, you know, we have used that money wisely uh, for things that are going to drive outcomes that we're going to like over the next four to five years, and there's more to come. Uh, there's more things out there today that we ought to be dedicating resources to. So I don't think it's, a, it's necessarily about uh, the, what the exact number is. Uh, I, but I can assure you that at $750 billion, uh, there are more than enough things out there today for us to go efficiently and effectively spend those dollars on. And I can guarantee you that the money that we got in 18 and 19 is being spent effic efficiently and effectively today. Thank you. Others? If I could just mention uh, a little bit about our contracting process. Uh, we know We've got the data on how long it takes us to contract things, and it's really not fair to call it contracting. It's really the procurement or the acquisition cycle that we're talking about. But the major building blocks there are the proposal or the procurement package development. That's just putting the requirement together and getting all of the funding documents lined up and the approvals put together to put out a request for proposal, for instance. Then there's the proposal timeline. Then there's the evaluation of the proposal timeline, and then there's the negotiations piece. Uh, in my mind, at least on the government side, we have control over at least two of those aspects. Uh, and we're starting with the procurement package development timeline. Uh, and those are, that runs anywhere from about 70 to 90 days if you're just talking, and that depends on when you say, okay, time has started. You know, we've had our procurement planning conference, go. 
Uh, and that's, that's way too long. Uh, you know, the, we want to at least cut that in half. But we don't want to just arbitrarily say, cut this, this piece in half. We want to look at the mission need that Emerald Moore was talking about. We, we have to view it from that uh, standpoint. When is this capability needed? When do we need it to be on contract so that whatever it takes to get there, in any of those aspects that I mentioned, that we're able to do it, but still stay within the, the guidelines that we have to in order to you know, be fair and reasonable and all that. So just a comment on some of the things that we're attacking to get that procurement cycle time down. Thank you. Let me remind the audience, there are two microphones, one over to my right and to the left. If you have any questions, uh, please come forward to a microphone. Let me, let me just pose uh, another question. About um, uh, now six years ago, whatever, I, I had the opportunity to co-chair a, a study on adaptability. And uh, in that study, I rec we recognized uh, three different uh, ways of acquiring equipment. One was through basically rapid acquisition procedures. Uh, another one, of course, was through programs of record. And then the third was through hedging strategies. It's, it just seemed that the programs of record, uh, unlike the other two, were operating at what I would call a, a Pentagon cadence. And one of our recommendations is how to better align it to an operational cadence. I just open it up to see if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah, can, I, I'd like to start off with that one. I'll, I'll take that one now. So I, I wanted to say something about the previous question, but it ties into this one. And so, so um, I mean, this is our infrastructure. So if, if we're going to do something in the everlasting and the enduring, what we put out there across the entire range of dot mill pivs, so people, training, I mean, truly putting uh, a piece of equipment out there that, that, that is honed with skill, that leverages the individual art of warfare, um, it's, it's got to be something that's comprehensive, that we, we train people to do. We put the infrastructure in the training environment, um, and, and we commence forward with... Uh, the investment that's necessary to do all of that. Um, I, I think one of the things that's, that's uh, hampering us to, to do that quickly, a very practical thing, is uh, the, the current threshold reprogramming guidance. So whether it's above or below th uh, threshold, ATR, BTR, we're, we're talking, I, I think we should uh, open an engagement um, with the Hill and, and, and look at ways that we can increase our flexibility, adaptability, um, as this technology is moving so very quickly um, aligning that to, to mission and to operational warfare is really important. I call that operational necessity. I mean, we cannot fail. You know, we, we have to succeed. So um, being second best in this area is just unacceptable. So we've got to find a way. We're looking for edges where we don't necessarily need to go back up through, I think what you're describing is the big A when you talk about the difference between procurement and acquisition. When we bring the entire apparatus of, of uh, headquarters Marine Corps to bear, we need to be able to do that with some agility. And, and going back to either uh, you know, the, the appropriators or uh, the, the entire chain and asking to shift when we know it's still inside of an operational um, uh, defined you know, capability like information warfare, it's such an expansive term that we think we can get to this new tech in a much more uh, uh, realistic way if we don't have to go back up and, and ask for permission to, to look across the, the range of appropriations and accounts that frankly were established a long time ago. Um, and we need to just refresh that and be very open to, to that practical application of agility. So that's, I hope that that's helpful. Thank you, uh, if you will. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Captain Yuri Sepp. I'm a Marine Communications Officer out of Arizona. Uh, my question is primarily for Admiral Moore and uh, Admiral Vogt. Uh, you both mentioned the importance of uh, uh, making sure that we adjust maintenance to operations rather than operations to maintenance uh, with the example of things like the USS McCain requiring a year of dry dock to recover from severe damage. Do we foresee or is there something that junior officers like myself should anticipate? in the coming years and changes to our relationship with logistics, or is there anything that we can do to sort of grease the skids? Go ahead. I'll, I'll just add and, and characterize, I think, I was kind of flip-flopping it the other way, actually, in, in stating that um, 
the Coast Guard has traditionally had a model of our, our deployment cycle. We don't have a garrison force. We're either out there or we're in a maintenance status. That that maintenance cycle has driven our operational cycle. And we're taking a look at our assets and resources to try to flip flop that to some extent to look at the operational requirement and as best we can build maintenance around that. But it's very challenging. We talked about the, def you know, the defense base, shipyard availability, things to that extent. But um, one of the things we mentioned, at least for the U.S. Coast Guard, is that in this realm, we're trying to push down as much as we can authorities, uh, decision making, uh, where able, push the risk management down to those commanding officers and operational uh, op officers in charge to make the decisions um, in a risk-based scenario as far as can I continue operating with this maintenance issue. And, um, but that's informed up the chain but instead of an immediate um, uh, signal up the chain that I have this uh, deficiency, you need to come and port right away. And we cut off the operational cycle. So pushing down the authority and the decision making. And I'll add one quick comment. Um, I hate to say this, but I don't think the U.S. Coast Guard could efficiently or effectively execute $750 billion of Department of Defense money, but we will efficiently, effectively, and very happily execute one seven hundredth of that amount um, and would love to get it. So if anyone can help us out, looking forward to that. So, Sir? Yeah, thanks. Um, and we look forward to working with you on the, on the Polar Icebreaker program as well. So. Uh, it's a great question. So my, my answer to you, if you're a junior officer out there today, whether it be a Marine or an Air Force or Navy, is uh, as I said up front, there, there's sometimes the, the new stuff uh, gets all the glamour, glamour, that's the kind of buy new, but uh, look, if you don't sustain it, you, uh, you're not going to have a ready force. I think one of the things you know, that we learned from some of the major issues like Fitzgerald and McCain is how fragile the sustainment base is. And so... Um, you know, what if we were to go to war or get into a shooting match in this era of great power competition? You know, it does point out that the industrial base, and in particular on the sustainment side, has got to be a key component of any strategy going forward. And so, you know, I, I like the focus today on the sustainment piece of it. Uh, there's a lot of stuff ongoing. If you heard Admiral Lesher over the previous days talk about data analytics and what we're trying to get at, a lot of that's being focused on the readiness side of the house. As the Navy grows from 287 ships today to 355, there's got to be a critical piece of that is understanding that it's all you've got to also grow the infrastructure to do the sustainment of that. So that means you've got to have more resources and the uh, to do maintenance. You've got to have more dry docks. You've got to have you know you've got to have a better working relationship with DLA and on the and the supply chain management side of the house. So um, you know we don't put put as much. Uh, emphasis is there as we should. I think that's turning around and I, you know, my message if you're a junior officer out there today is, you know, our best and brightest in many cases should be focused on the on the sustainment side of the house just as much as it is on buying the new stuff. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. Bob? Yes, uh, we heard about, uh, ever, repeatedly here about changing the culture when it comes to acquisition and procurement and I know efforts are underway. Uh, I just wonder how many, how often you can actually retain the savings you might find through efficiency and initiatives. Uh, but interestingly, I'd like to find uh, what you're doing, particularly uh, Admiral Peters and uh, Admiral Becker, who talked about the workforce, <coughs> talk obviously about the importance of that workforce. What are you doing to change the culture uh, that you, you feel is significantly succeeding? One aspect of change <clears throat> is how you look at uh, what the status quo is uh, and how you look at where you are in, in a, with a particular way to measure that performance level and then determine what that performance level should be with specificity and then figure out how you're going to get there. We've undertaken a, a, a path to look at how we deliver modernized systems to a ship and an availability to make sure that the ship gets out of the availability, not only on time, but with a modernized package of capabilities that are functioning, that are cyber ready, and that the crew knows how to operate and sustain. 
Well, that doesn't seem like rocket surgery. It just seems like the way we should be doing business. Well, what's our performance on that? What's the measurement of that? Where are we on first pass success or first pass yield on the test that tells us that box A is ready to go? And we looked at the numbers, and they weren't where they needed to be. So we put in place a strategy to measure how we were performing, decided where we wanted to be, by when, and then set about figuring out what the, the leading indicators were for how we would be able to change that lagging indicator of performance against SOVOT tests. Not only did we drive the number higher towards where we wanted to be, but I think even more important, we drove down the variation. We drove down the variation in order of magnitude because now we're focusing on what it takes to change the performance of the end test of a box in a modernization. We're gonna scale that. We're gonna scale that mindset and scale that approach to what it looks like to test all of the systems that have to come together to deliver capability, not just the things we modernize, but the legacy systems to which they attach and deliver a system of systems test that has a first pass yield. And I'm looking out there at my fleet readiness director, a first pass yield of 100%. That's gonna be the goal, a first pass yield of 100%. And how are we gonna get there? What does that mean? And who's it gonna to take to get us there? Well, it's gotta be a team effort between us between the platform TICOMs, uh, between the, the, the ship, uh, across the waterfront, if you will, to figure out what those leading indicators are, such as did those sailors that are gonna operate the, the new version of Canes, did they even go to the Canes school? Do we know that are they gonna be there for deployment? Do we know that the legacy systems that are gonna attach to, to our command and control system have been checked out and are operational, even though they haven't been used in three or four or five months of downtime. So how are we changing the culture? I use that as an example of a, of a really broad goal of changing SOTs to 100% successful, but then how does that same strategy apply to how long it takes to get a procurement on contract? And as was said earlier, it's not just a contracting strategy, it's not just contracting action, it starts with the need coming from a sponsor and then the the program office figuring out what that need translates to in the way we were going to go out and contract it. So if we measure that, and we again start to find the leading indicators that will lead to a lagging indicator of time from good idea of need to sign contract, how are we going to change that? We look for ways across the enterprise to do that and apply that same strategy, I change the culture. We change the culture together to a culture of looking for the problem, solving the problem, taking that new process that we changed put it in just the way we do business, and then go look for the next thing that's going to lead us to success. That's a, it's an incredibly rich topic uh, when you talk about uh, cultures and culture change. Uh, I guess the, the journey that we've been on at, at NAVAIR is the recognition that you can't be vague about what the expectations are. And uh, what Emerald Be Becker mentioned in terms of 100% first pass yield, that sets the measure, right? That's incredibly important to quantify what the aspiration is. And uh, so it, when you approach this, then you've got the quantification and you get that, that message out and it's, it's aligned with, uh, you know, our national strategy, our, our naval strategy, our Navy and Marine Corps strategy. Uh, and then when you go about actually affecting change, you've got to have the data that, that points you to where the root cause issues are. Uh, but you've got to, if, you, if you're familiar with design thinking, it goes further than just the data. You have to incorporate the user experience here. And uh, especially when we're talking about uh, like flight clearances or acquisition cycle time. Uh, so we, we talk about, you know, turning our engineers into more of a service organization. And the first thing the, the head engineer will say was, hey, we did 22,000 flight clearances last year and 90% of those were on time. Uh, when you bring in the user experience, you, you find that, you know, the the timeline was actually dictated by the engineers to begin with. So kind of an, it's a little easier to meet that metric. 
Uh, and we've got so many examples of where multiple different uh, disciplines had, you know, had requirements associated with the, the flight clearance uh, that really drove the timeline. And so we took something very simple that perhaps was even flown uh, on uh, in other navies or in, in other applications, and we just we we drew out that process. So. Uh, you've got to use the user experience in there as part of what you're designing the solution to be. And then the, the last thing I'll mention is when you do have successes, you've got to celebrate them. Uh, and uh, so we've had, you know, small pockets of success, and uh, we want to make those visible and make everybody want to attain those. So thank you for the question. Thank you. One thing I would just add to this, and what I just heard was, you know, uh, outcomes and process need to be in, in balance with each other, and all too often, process trumps outcomes. Outcomes really need to trump process, if you will. We need to be able to be flexible with our process to achieve the outcomes that we want. And if we do that, things will change. Culture will change. I'm going to jump in out real quick. Can I add something to that? So it, I think it's as simple as this. There's a lot of people involved in acquisition of things, uh, but there can only be one person in charge. And like Secretary Gertz says, the program management is one thing, but program leadership is another. So that leader, what we did at Systems Command down in Quantico said, there's a, the, the PM is a focus of main effort. So the PM is in charge, and that PM has to weigh all of this risk we're talking about, like Admiral Peters just mentioned on the, the engineer side. Um, and that's not to diminish any one of those competencies. And that, that program manager better take that risk very seriously. But if there are seven people in charge, you're just not going to get anywhere. And that means trust. That means leadership. And, and just some very basic uh, theories of practice there. We, we ha really have to put, you know, solid people in these positions, trust them, and let them run wild. Let them go crazy. And... Uh, you know, take some risk and, and do some things that are, that are fanciful and exciting. But you can't be seven people in charge, otherwise we'll, we just we won't get anywhere. You know? Thank you. Thank you and good morning. Dan Rapinski with Oracle. My question is for Admiral Peters. Admiral Peters, from an industry's perspective, the takeaways that I heard were focused areas on people, labs, retention, and sustainment. What would your recommendations and uh, guidance be on how industry can help NAVAIR in those areas, generally speaking. Thank you. And that's probably a question that uh, other folks will want to jump in on also. Uh, so I've, I could go down a list of where industry could help. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, industry needs to be accountable for the products that they're delivering. We are delivering equipment that's that's not reliable, and it's it's just not reliable. It's it's a great business to be in because we pay for the equipment and then we pay to fix it, and uh, then we pay to fix it again. Uh, we've we've got to get ownership back in the product. Uh, we're invested in our platforms, and you know we can't just shift platforms like they do in the commercial world. But in the commercial world. We would never accept, uh, you know, the type of reliability that we have uh, on our on our products. In terms of developing technology, that I just ask you consider, uh, you know, taking advantage of those opportunities to jointly develop, as I as I mentioned, it, with with our infrastructure and look for those opportunities. Uh, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I just, can I just want to add one thing? Uh, one thing you can do with, about the technologies and the development is protect them. Protect them. Protect your infrastructure. Protect your IP. Protect your data and protect our data. And that includes the primes and your suppliers and your subs. Protect us. Thank you. Hi, Megan Eckstein with USNI News. Um, I have a maintenance question, uh, partly for Admiral Moore and partly for the rest of the panel. 
Um, it seems to me with new shipbuilding programs, there's been an emphasis on leveraging existing designs, whether it's LPD Flight 2 leveraging the San Antonio class, or whether it's the frigate that requires a parent design. So I wondered what opportunity there is to really leverage existing data to do smarter maintenance going forward to keep those ships more ready, and what conversations you're having about that now. And then for the rest of the panel, you know, kind of brings to mind uh, the Hornet slip going into the Super Hornet slip, really looking at that data to do a smarter plan the second time around. And I wonder if there's any other examples you could offer for how to, you know, leverage pre-existing data um, to do smarter maintenance going forward. Yeah, I think it's a great question. I mean, <clears throat> one of our challenges is that uh, our desire every time we put a new platform out there is we want everything to be new on the platform. And while the mission may change and the, the ship may design may change, there are some basic fundamental things on the ship that don't necessarily have to change. An air conditioning plant is an air conditioning plant. Seawater is seawater. Chill water is chill water. Go down the line. So we are looking as we you know move into the Flight 3 DDG, as we go into FFGX, as we've gone into the new Amphib, to where is there some areas for some commonality that we could get after? So that two things. One, we have more common systems that we know how to operate. And then where are there areas that we could leverage the existing experience on the existing platforms using data that we have to build the maintenance uh, philosophy and the maintenance plans for those platforms going forward so that we're not starting from scratch? I mean, frankly, you know, if you go look at LCS today, one of the biggest challenges is, you know, we developed a whole new maintenance philosophy for LCS compared to how we were maintaining other ships. And it, it's caused us significant challenges, and we've kind of had to rearrange that two or three times as we learn. We would like to get to, as we get to the future service combatant and FFGX, uh, and is to a more stable understanding of sustainment uh, that recognizes you got to put new stuff on the ship. But the fact of the matter is that a lot of the core stuff that you have to do to, to, to maintain the ship doesn't have to be new. So uh, we are taking steps in that direction. Uh, I'd happy, be happy to talk to you about more of that in detail, but it's, it's certainly part of our thinking going forward on the new platforms. I'll, I'll add a quick comment in that regard. You heard earlier on the uh, Polar Icebreaker Program, or what we're now calling the Polar Security Cutter. We have an integrated program office with the U.S. Navy uh, going on very well, and, and the initial um, approach was to leverage existing designs and mature technologies walking right into it um, as we move forward because the whole design of itself is old, old technologies that we haven't employed in years. And so that is where a lot of the focus needs to be. So I've been pretty successful thus far. We're waiting here on the budget cycle, like literally right now. Um, on, the, on the question earlier as far as ownership, I thought that was a good comment. Uh, I'll just give you a quick example. There's a a capability hanging from the ceiling in the middle of the hall floor here that has a Coast Guard stripe on it. Uh, not a new concept, but it hasn't been deployed all that often. Not in its purest form, but that is a contractor-owned, contractor-operated system, meaning the risk is with the contractor, and but it does provide some freedom for that contractor to market uh, that capability leverage lessons learned on that capability to push it out for other mission sets um, within the interagency, um, U.S. government, or even uh, overseas uh, markets as well, so. Thank you. Chris? Yeah, um, Chris Lucas with NetScout. Uh, just a general question. Uh, given the speed of change in both the threat and technology, and we talked about the eight year and the obsolescence, um, what are your thoughts on how to acquire <laughs> the right technology versus the wrong technology to get to the outcomes that, that, that we demand? Well, just on the ship platform side of the house, just real quick, is you know, we're pretty good at predicting what the threat's going to look like two to three years down the road. It gets a little fuzzier after that, but you know, we're, most of these platforms we're building are we're keeping them for, if it's an aircraft carrier, for 50 years. I dare say back in 1975 when we delivered Nimitz, we probably had no idea what the threat was going to look like in 2025. So we've got to do two things. We've got to be able to address the near-term threat platforms and when we build these things, but we've got to build platforms in a way that gets to the adaptability piece. So I guess back to the comment about the, the cadence, Pentagon cadence, which got a kind of chuckle out of. Not everything is going to be rapid prototyping. Uh, and not everything is, you know, there are going to be things that we're going to, that are going to be program of record. And program of record has served us well in many, many cases. But as we build the new program of record, we've got to think about platforms uh, that, you know, we're going to keep for 50 years. And how do you build them with enough space weight and power so that as the threat changes, 
rapidly, you can rapidly adapt that platform. I think you're going to see more of that if, as we had the future service combatant and frigate. The, clearly, the new carrier and DDG-1000 are built with this in mind. A lot of space and weight and a lot of ability to generate power because we don't know what the threat's going to look like. So I, I, I mean, I would offer that from the ship side of the house. And just from the aircraft side of the house, uh, we would like to build more platforms that have open architecture, uh, especially for you know our operational flight programs. Uh, we want to spend our funds on buying tails and equipment and weapons. We don't want to spend our funds on you know the next software release, right? Um, the only way we're going to be able to do that is if we get to some open standards associated with the architecture. Um, so th that's my take. Anyone else? I've got uh, one of those is um, there's a lot of stuff that comes out of the Pentagon. Some of it's actually good. And <laughs> you know, one of it, uh, there was an initiative a few years ago called AIR, Acquisition Intelligence and Requirements. And that's, uh, it feeds into the narrative I just talked about earlier where the PM is running the show, and in spite this, contrasting it against a traditional practice of swinging by the intel, making sure you've accounted for um, the threat at the, you know, at certain milestones or benchmarks. Instead of doing that, you just bring them in early, make that, you know, make the IC a part of the team, a part of the, the competency inside, you know, the mission function of acquisition. Um, and you build an acquisition strategy that's based on that dynamic threat because we know it's moving. We know it's, you know, that's just reality. Um, and uh, like I said, I, I, I kind of, you know, picked on the engineers a moment ago, but whether it be a lawyer or a contracting officer, everyone gets a vote, and including, of course, the enemy. And that's, that's a significant issue, and we need to respect that. And I think air is a way of bringing that in and uh, accounting for it at the very get-go and making sure that they're empowered to, to sway your acquisition strategy, your material solution, or at least the architecture, whether it's MOSA or something else that accounts for that threat. And there's a price for it too, right? So, Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Hi, Steve Alonzo from Marine Electric. I'm here because of the system after 7,800 flight hours, at least most of me is here. I build your, uh, I build your horseshoe nails for all your different products. Okay, I hear such a, a buzz to go to the technology. Let me give you an example, 3D printing. Okay, I hear the talking heads, 3D printing, 3D printing. In my CNC shop, I have 37 mil spec and industry specs to build a piece of aluminum and to make it into a flight worthy or a ship worthy part. There's not one person that can tell me how all these 37 specs are going to change so that I can have the same integrity to put a sailor or an airman at risk with this new technology. Everybody's looking at the front end, but nobody looks at really all the underlying specs that have to sustain it. Who is going to make the decision to change these specs that are across three services, okay, and involve every one of your products? I don't see anybody taking those steps. Who's going to do that? I think that would be Dean, uh, to be honest with you. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you want to take a crack at it? That was a, a great pseudo question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, let me uh, mention how we're uh, approaching additive manufacturing or advanced manufacturing. Uh, and it's not the solution in every case. Uh, just yesterday I was at our depot at North Island looking at uh, canopy repairs. And there's a few components on the canopy repair uh, that's required for the canopy repair that we can't get anymore. Uh, there's some brackets and things like that. And so I said, well, you know, let's look at some opportunities to manufacture those ourselves. Uh, and you know, this is basically just making your own luck, right? Uh, because we do that all the time in our depots. We, we manufacture components bushings and things like that, that that we need to repair aircraft. Uh, in this particular case, they looked at it and they said, you know, it's, it just doesn't fit here. But having gone through the exercise, we can actually additively manufacture some of the tooling that's required for the sheet metal that is required for those components. Uh, so it, 
I, I agree that, that sometimes we jump on things too quickly, but we're, but we're putting things in categories, and in those particular situations that have those considerations that you mentioned, those are not going to be additively manufactured. They're awaiting on other technology. Uh, so you're 100% you're right. But for those things that we can additively manufacture, then it gives us the, a different uh, supportability standpoint than we've ever had before, the ability to support ourselves on the ships and in the field that, that we've never been able to do, or to manufacture those things that are no longer produced. So thank you for continuing to produce all of those components that, that you do, and I, and I hope more manufacturers do that. But for those that don't, we, we want a few other options. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank this panel. I will say that I have uh, the greatest confidence in our future given the quality and caliber of the leadership that we have amongst us here today. Uh, I will also say that uh, throughout this discussion, I think we now know who the double E is. We probably know who the pilots are and the aeronautical engineer, but who is the band leader? That's the question. That's the question. Anybody want to offer an answer? Well, yeah. How shy. Metallica? <laughs> Metallica? My next gig is 7 March at Mordecai's in D.C. if you really want All to consider right. this part. Answer's in. All right. Let's give him a hand. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to the panel, to our moderator, to you and the audience for being with us. And on behalf of FC International and the United States Naval Institute, uh, I, I think we got exactly what we're looking for. Not only, and, and the quote earlier from uh, Secretary Gertz was great. You know, it's not program management, it's program leadership. And what you have up here are leaders who've taken the challenge on directly, providing capabilities, providing those capabilities and acquiring them in a way that uh, I think is moving to that new normal, hopefully. Hopefully, we wish you the best and great success. And on behalf of USNI and AFSIA, we are going to present a gift to you, One Nation Under Drones. We didn't hear that word once. Uh, sorry, Boris, you didn't mention drones, so we missed, we missed a full sweep on the bingo card. Uh, but a, a great book from USNI. And drones inside, are so 2017. All right. All right. <laughs> so 2017. And inside, there's a, a bookmark from AFSIA International. Thank you all once again for being with us. Uh, lunch is at noon. And... Uh, Proceed through our uh, vendors out here and find the solutions we're looking for tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>